Great to have such a good turnout. I'm going to try to project my voice a little bit. Um, in, in the office, everyone tells me my voice is really, really loud and it carries. So I'm hoping that's actually going to um, that's going to be an advantage. But we are trying to get the mic fixed too. So hopefully we'll be able to use it here in a little bit. But um, my name is Gwen Holdman. I am the founding director of the Alaska Center for Energy and Power at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, I have um, been working on energy issues in this state and in this community for pretty much my entire career. Um, since, gosh, where's, where's Tom DeLong? I was just thinking, when were, we, when were we on the Green Power Advisory Committee for Golden Valley? Like, how long ago was that? 2003. 2003. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's been a while. Um, and, uh, and, and, and energy has been something, just figuring out sustainable energy pathways for the future of Alaska, for the future of Fairbanks, has been something that's been really near and dear to my heart. Um, I actually spent about 20 years living off the power grid. I'm very, very grateful to be a member of Golden Valley Electric um, Association now because <laughs> I spent a lot of time producing my own power. I was also... Um, the lead engineer for developing the geothermal power plant out at Chena Hot Springs. My background is in mechanical engineering and physics. I came up here to be a space physicist at the university, switched over to focus more on my mechanical engineering and thermal background because um, living off grid, I realized how important affordable energy is um, for just the modern way of life that we all depend on and appreciate. And so, um, so, um, so anyway, I um, founded the Alaska Center for Energy and Power 15 years ago. I'm very happy to have turned over the reins of that organization to Jeremy Casper. Thank you, Jeremy, for taking over, um, which has allowed me to um, dive into some strategies for the state of Alaska in terms of future energy planning. And one area that I've always been interested in pursuing is um, advanced micro reactors or nuclear reactors. And so I'm really pleased to be able to share a little bit of my observations or a little background on micro reactors um, with the community here tonight. The Alaska Center for Energy and Power, we're based at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. It's an applied energy research program. We founded it 15 years ago, really with the idea of having the university partner with our communities around the state to find um, sustainable and affordable energy solutions. And so we work a lot on um, renewable energy. That's, that's a quite, quite a lot um, of what we do. We also do testing in our laboratory there. We work a lot with the utility industry, work a lot directly with our communities all over the state. Um, but we also look at uh, other energy alternatives, and so nuclear is one example of that. Um, so the presentation I'm going to give tonight, I'm just going to give some basics on what are we talking about when we talk about nuclear energy, um, talk a little bit about conventional or legacy nuclear energy, and then shift gears and talk a little bit about advanced nuclear reactors. And the one takeaway that I'm really hoping that everyone in this room gets out of this presentation is really understanding that there's a real significant difference between conventional or legacy nuclear energy and these advanced reactor technologies that are really the future of the nuclear energy industry. And so distinguishing or discerning between those two is something I would really like, um, like people to take away from today. And then talking about applications here in Alaska or just where this kind of fits into our, our total, the total range of energy options that we have here in the state. Because I, the way I see it is that we're really in this time of energy transition um, at, at all levels and certainly globally certainly nationally and at the state level. And that gives us options. You know, the word transition in and of itself, um, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a Latin word. So trans is like to, to move across or to go across. And the it is to go and then shun. The shun part is really about just converting um, a verb into a noun. It's that transition is really about moving from one point to another without stopping in between. And so, you know, we're really moving through this energy transition where we're going from a world that's really dependent on fossil fuels to a world that is not dependent on, um, on, on sources of fossil fuels as a primary energy source. And this in-between path that we're taking, um, there's a lot of opportunities for selecting the path that we want to take. Um, there's also a lot of disagreements maybe on what the timeline associated with those two endpoints of that energy transition are. But there is going to be a day when our children or our grandchildren or maybe ourselves are not going to be putting gasoline into our vehicles. And whenever that time comes, we're going to need other sources and other forms of energy. And renewables is a big part of that. But we also still are going to need some forms of baseload energy. And that's why I think nuclear energy can provide a potential important um, component of that. Um, I do want to just kind of start out 
with a little bit, just talking a little bit about the physics and what nuclear energy is, um, as opposed to these other sources of energy, whether we're extracting energy from solar sources, which includes not just solar, but also wind. Um, most of the types of energy sources we use really originate from different various kinds of solar energy. Um, nuclear is different because we're really talking about there's these four basic fundamental sources. There's gravitational energy, there's you know, um, electro, electrostatic energy forces, then there's a weak and strong nuclear force. And so really nuclear energy is related to these atomic bombs and the nucleus of atoms and the amount of energy that's available there. And so the amount of energy that's available from nuclear energy is substantively and significantly many, many trillions of times more than what you would find, for example, through gravitational energy, through, um, for example, water behind a dam, like Bradley, Bradley Lake, for example. And so when you look at, theoretically, the amount of energy that's available in the nuclear bonds of like a gallon of water, it could literally power the rail bite for 15 years. Now, we can't actually extract that energy from a gallon of water because it's not really um, organized in a way that makes it easy to break those chemical bonds or those nuclear bonds. But theoretically, um, there's, there's a lot of energy in a very small volume of, of matter. Um, I also like to think about it in terms of when we're thinking about rural Alaska in terms of how much fuel oil would be, how many barges of fuel oil that would be equivalent to a gallon of, of water. So, so when we think about these different energy sources, you know, and nuclear energy, there's two different options. There's two different ways of thinking about nuclear energy. There's nuclear fusion and there's nuclear fission. Most of the, all of the conventional energy and all of the nuclear energy or power um, that we use today is nuclear fission, which I'll talk about in a second. If we were able to do nuclear fusion, it would essentially solve all of our world's energy problems, right? That would basically solve our energy problems because this is really the type of energy that is in um, the sun, right? And so there are people working right now on whether we can actually have nuclear fusion because that wouldn't result in radioactive byproducts and a lot of the concerns that we have about nuclear fission and conventional nuclear power. Um, so this is like an example of like what they're working on in the U.S. today. Um, deuterium, tritium, different elements or different isotopes of like hydrogen, for example. And you can combine those and fuse them into helium. The reason why this particular, um, this particular fusion reaction is of interest is because it can happen at lower pressures and temperatures than others. But essentially all of these are things that happen in stars. And so they're under like very high temperature and pressure and these plasma sort of, um, and so it's difficult to sustain these reactions under the kinds of conditions that we can um, produce in a laboratory. Nuclear fusion, fission, sorry, is a little bit different. And this is kind of what we use for um, all nuclear power production today. And basically what you've got there is you're taking uranium um, atoms, an isotope of uranium that can, um, that's unstable and can decay into lighter elements and releasing energy in a process. Both nuclear fission and fusion do release energy in the same way. And uranium-235, it's, it's an isotope of uranium that's naturally occurring in the rocks all around us. Um, there's many, ice, uh, most elements have some sort of radio, radioisotopic elements or versions of themselves that occur naturally. And so one example I mentioned, I was involved with the China Hot Springs geothermal power plant. And what's really powering that, what's that power plant and what's actually creating that hot water is the natural decay of uranium and thorium in the rock in that granite pluton. And so um, in many ways, I like to tease Bernie Carl and say, you know, you've actually got, um, you've, got a, uh, uh, you've got a nuclear power plant there at China Hot Springs. <laughs> so next time you see him, you can, you can give him a hard time about that. But it's just the natural decay of those products over time in that rock that builds up heat in that rock. And then you've got water that's sort of flowing through natural fissions and fractures in that rock that then is allowing that heat to come to the surface. And then we're using that for productive means, like whether that's heating the, the hot springs out there or heating the greenhouses or, um, or generating power from that hot water. And really, in a lot of ways, that's exactly how a nuclear power plant works, right? You've got some sort of more condensed form of that same uranium kinds of isotopes that you're basically um, co combining into a more condensed version of that isotope that is fissile. And you're creating heat, and then you're circulating some sort of fluid through that. 
and then you're using that heat that you're extracting from that reactor for producing power through conventional power generation technology, usually steam turbine generator, just like, just like our coal plants here in the interior use. So that's really the basis of nuclear power. So conventional nuclear power, uh, there's a few different versions of that. This is actually the first nuclear power plant in the US at Idaho National Lab. Um, it it um, started generating power in 1951. That was the first um, commercial, or I don't know if it was really commercial because it was at the lab, but basically it initially just powered um, 800 watts of light bulbs. That was like the very first power plant and then eventually they were able to scale it up. Um, you've obviously got uh, quite a few nuclear reactors in our, in our um, naval fleet. Those are pretty different than, um, than what we use for, uh, for, for, um, for nuclear power in terms of the nuclear power industry. They're much more, the uranium is much more enriched, so it has much a higher proportion of that uranium-235 as opposed to the 238 isotopes. It's highly enriched, so those, um, so those reactors are very small in footprint um, and very powerful. And so they're a little bit different than conventional nuclear, which is only enriched at like three to 5% of that um, uranium-235. There's a couple examples of real projects or proposed projects in Alaska. Um, one is the Fort Greeley SM1 reactor, which um, began producing power in 1962 and operated for about a decade. They're actually doing final decommissioning of the reactor dome starting this year. So that's actually been um, around, the, the reactor's been gone for decades, but they're actually final, finally decommissioning the rest of the building that the reactor was actually in now. Um, another project was this Galena Toshiba um, reactor. And this is a project that actually got quite a bit of attention or interest, not just here in Alaska, but also at the national level, because it was the first time that a community had actually said, we're a small community and we are interested in understanding whether a micro reactor would be a possible technology for us to explore for long-term power generation heating um, for our community. And so that was the first time that, that a community had expressed significant interest in potentially obtaining a site license, working with this Toshiba 4S reactor design. And it forced the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which oversees all the licensing for nuclear um, power plants in this country, to go think through the process of how a community would go, what steps would be required, what information is needed in order for a community to get a site license related to a small reactor project. And this never went forward. Um, this, this particular design is what we still today call a paper reactor. So it was a concept only. It, it never went any further than the drawing board and it's no longer in consideration today. But it did really spur a lot of conversations, especially at the national level, about what it would look like for a small reactor that could be deployed in a more remote setting for heat and power. Um, we've been working at the Alaska Center for Energy and Power on micro reactors and small modular reactors for over a decade. We were asked by the legislature back in um, 2011 or 2010, not too long after ASAP was formed, to take a close look at whether small reactor technologies could potentially be an option for Alaska. At the time, we didn't actually have anybody that had a lot of um, expertise uh, in this area, but we were able to put together a team to look at the economics, look at the technology. Um, and actually, the first report that we did back in 2010 or 11 talks a lot about the history of, um, of nuclear energy in Alaska, including things like um, Project Chariot and Amchitka and Burnt Mountain. And there's like a few other examples um, of projects that have been, um, have been done. We really did a lot of work on, on looking into those and including um, the Fort Greeley reactor as well. So it's got a lot of that history in it. Um, but back at that time, there were really no active designs under consideration that were really of the size that were of interest in Alaska. The one that was closest was the new scale reactor, um, which is actually just this July, um, was, got, got, um, was approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as a licensed nuclear reactor design. That's the very first one that's been, um, that's been approved by the NRC. And so that's pretty recent. Um, it's, a, it's a 50, um, 50, me kil 50 megawatt reactor design, and the idea there is that it's installed in multiple modules. So something like that 
It's the design is intended to replace conventional nuclear reactors where you have a bunch of smaller reactors with less nuclear material in any one place and with some of the inherent and intrinsic safety features that I'll talk about here in a minute. Our more recent report was um, also done at the request of the legislature, essentially updating that 2010 report. And um, this also included some recommended, re recommended um, uh, adjustments to state statutes um, that, the, that the administration took up and then was passed through SB 177. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But it does an, uh, an updated analysis of, um, of basically the technology and looking at the vendors that are now entering the market because there's been a ton of activity in the last 10 years in this space. And then also looking at the economics and some of the other um, considerations. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But basically, when we were thinking a little bit about this from a decision making sort of matrix, right? When you're thinking about whether it makes sense to consider nuclear energy as part of our energy mix in a state, there's really four questions I feel like that we can boil it down to asking, right? Does the technology exist? Because it, if it doesn't exist, like, we're not, there's no, not much point in having a conversation. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Is the technology safe? Are these safe? You know, what does that look like? Um, if it's safe, is it economic? And then lastly, is it a responsible thing to be deploying in Alaska? Is it a responsible thing to be deploying anywhere? What are the sorts of things that we need to be thinking about from an environmental standpoint, from, a, from, a, um, from, from basically looking at how we're, um, what are we doing in terms of minimizing the footprint that we have on this earth with the technologies that we're deploying? And at that time, 10 years ago, we sort of predicted the possibility of a project around 2028. Yeah, so this is a chart that we tried to put together. And this is like very much um, just kind of relative to the different technologies. And so these are different companies that all have various um, designs for micro reactors. The size of the reactor in terms of the output from an electric power standpoint is on the y-axis here. And then the increasing maturity level is really just sort of relative to one another. So you can see that new scale reactor I was talking about. It says 60 there. They actually have reduced that to 50. But um, 50, 60 megawatt new scale is the one that's closest. Could you go over that again? Could you go over that again? Yeah. Okay, so, so basically this is just kind of how close we are to these becoming commercial and it's relative to one another. It's not relative to some sort of overall, you know, there's, there's not like a scale, there's not a timeline here. I'm not saying that this reactor is going to, you know, be deployed at a certain date. So this is sort of like think about it as like a horse race. These are different um, horses in a race and one could overtake the other at any point in time. So don't think too much about the individual reactor designs. I'm not even going to go into most of them. But you can see there's like a big break at this like 10 megawatt level. So this is, these are the really small reactor designs under 10 megawatts. Um, and so 10 megawatts, I mean to put that into perspective, that's smaller than the university power plant. Okay. Um, and then you've got these ones that are bigger here. That, and this is, I should mention, a logarithmic scale, so it's not. That's electric, not thermal. It's electric. And that's, that's, a, that's an important point, yeah. It's electric. And part of the problem with the economics of all of these is that they produce a lot of thermal energy, and there's a lot of value to the thermal energy in Alaska that's difficult to, value, to put a value on in some cases. And so that's one challenge around the economics. I'm just going to, same graph, but I'm just going to say, you know, you've got these small modular reactors that are in the top half here that range from like 20 megawatts up to 300 megawatts. And this is really intended as sort of the replacement of the, 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 nuclear, the conventional nuclear power plants, right? So this is kind of the direction that they're looking at for conventional nuclear power in this country. Um, you know, one thing that we may not recognize or I was actually surprised about is that nuclear energy represents 20% of the power generation. Um, in this country. It's actually more than all of the renewables, including hydroelectric, put together, which is sort of surprising because we've seen this real proliferation of renewables, um, and they're certainly, they're certainly advancing, but nuclear power is still playing a really important component of our, um, of our energy supply in this country. Those plants are aging. They're going to need to be replaced at some point in time, and we don't want to replace them with the same light water reactor technology that was used, that was developed you know, back in the 60s. And so the idea is that they would be um, replaced with these small modular reactors, these advanced reactor designs. I'll talk a little bit more about the attributes of those in a minute. 
Um, but the ones that are, and actually this is actually an example of this new scale, the one that was recently um, licensed through the NRC just in July. Um, the idea here is that there'd be 12 of these 50 megawatt modules in a single facility. So again, um, you have the ability to sort of um, turn them on and off. You can refuel them at different schedules and you have less nuclear material in any one place. And these have a lot of the same passive, intrinsically and inherently passive safety designs I'll talk about in a minute that relate to these smaller micro reactor designs. So these little guys down here, and I guess they go all the way across, um, these are micro reactor technologies that are under development for the US market. So these are much smaller. These are probably more interesting for the Alaska market at this point in time. Um, we aren't gonna be installing um, 12, 50 megawatt new scale reactors up here in Alaska. In the future, maybe, there would be a day where they decide to deploy these in like single modules, but that's not their business model right now. And so really, none of that bigger stuff is on the table, I think, for Alaska at this point in time. But this smaller range here, below 10 megawatts, and really this USNC has actually, is looking at more of a 20 megawatt um, output sort of design right now, is sort of the area that we've spent a little bit more time looking at. And so these micro reactors, um, there's not really a, an, a, a precise definition in terms of size, but typically they're between like one and 10 megawatts of electric power output, not thermal. Um, so thermal would be about three times as much, right? Um, and then the idea is that they're really factory assembled, um, constructed, and then transported to the site pretty much fully, fully um, ready to operate. So they have a pretty small operational footprint. Um, in some cases, it's just a few sort of oversized shipping containers, essentially, that are brought to that site. Um, the Evinci reactor, for example, is a five megawatt reactor design that is designed as like um, four independent modules that would be brought onto a site. One has the reactor and the other have um, ancillary equipment that's required for power generation, <coughs> stuff like that. This next bullet here, employs passive safety operating and fuel designs. That's something I'm really interested in. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute because to me, that's really, that, that is inherently what makes these, this technology interesting to me compared to um, conventional nuclear. Um, and then there's a few other attributes here. I'll just read them since maybe it is still a little bit blurry, but you know, they have, they're pretty much, they're semi-autonomously controlled and operated. So basically you have this nuclear battery. It's producing heat. The power generation equipment, again, is conventional power generation equipment. We're not doing anything weird or fancy or special there. It's basically, typically, you're driving a steam turbine is what you're doing with the heat that you're getting from this reactor. And then um, it doesn't, this is an important one, it doesn't require water for cooling. Um, that's another thing that's pretty interesting because it decouples um, the need to have a reactor close to a cooling water source, which has been the case for reactor, conventional reactor technology. And secondly, it pretty significantly reduces any potential for environmental co co contamination through like water or something like that, um, through effluent. And then long intervals without, without refueling. And so the idea is that most of these are refueled on, let's say, a 10-year cycle. And really, they aren't, many of them aren't even intended to be refueled in the field. The idea is that you take that entire module, you ship it back to the manufacturer, and you put another one in. So it's kind of plug and play. It's, it's essentially a nuclear battery. These are just two examples, and I, and I want to just say they're definitely two examples. They're at slightly different size, um, sizes. So this is the Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation. They're at about 20 megawatts. They have a design that's intended to sit below ground. They're working right now with the city of Valdez and Copper Valley Electric Association to do an analysis or a feasibility study related to um, deploying one of those in the Valdez area. And then this Westinghouse Evinci design, it's a, a five megawatt reactor. That's the one I was talking about. It's a smaller reactor design that's sitting, that has these four kind of oversized conics containers that basically make up the, the plant and the footprint of the plant. So they, there is a lot of these, I mean, there's quite a few different designs and they have a lot of, there's a, a lot of different strategies associated with them. Um, all of them have these kind of inherent safety features that I'll talk about a little bit more here in a minute. Um, we've been working really closely with the Nuclear Reactor Innovation Center at Idaho National Lab. The plan is to test and deploy 
many of these early reactor um, concept designs um, at, the, at the lab there. Um, there's several that are on the drawing board to be deployed there over the next three years or so, three or four years. Many of you probably have heard of the Eielson Air Force Base um, proposed reactor or planned reactor design. So this is interesting um, because it's a Department of Defense reactor, but it's intended to be a commercial reactor that would be um, done in partnership um, with a private entity that would own and operate the reactor and sell power um, and heat potentially to the Air Force under a power purchase agreement. So this is theoretically um, could be the first commercial reactor um, deployed in the US at Eielson Air Force Base if they stay on track in terms of their timeline, which right now they're, they're projecting 2027, but they've already been a little bit delayed in even releasing the RFP that they're planning um, to put out in the near future related to soliciting vendors for this potential project. So there's no vendor that's been selected yet, um, this is just a project that the Air Force um, has been planning. So I mentioned this earlier, but licensing and, and regulation. So that, that particular project at Allison, since it's a commercial project, it will fall under all the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the typical permitting process through the NRC. There's other projects that the Department of Defense is planning. One is called Project Pele. That would be a truly transportable or a mobile reactor design that would be truck mounted. And the idea there would be that it would be used for like forward operating bases or something like that. It's also an interesting design that you know someday could maybe replace diesel generation in rural Alaska. But that's a truly just DOD project. It's not intended to be connected to a commercial grid or owned by a commercial vendor. And so it doesn't fall under the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. DOD has its own process. But because the Eielson project is intended as a commercial project, it would be licensed under the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, and that typically includes a two-step process. Likely, there's going to be um, now there's an opportunity to do a combined um, site and operating uh, construction and operating license uh, simultaneously. And that's probably the process that this one will follow. Um, and then there's also the need to comply with state laws. And one of those, SB 177, has addressed um, siting authority in Alaska. Originally, siting authority for any nuclear power plant was, um, was retained by the legislature, by the state legislature. And now that's been um, amended so that for a smaller project under 50 megawatts, um, that, that, site, that siting approval would re be retained with the local community or the local jurisdiction. So in this case, the Fairbanks North several. Yeah? Yeah, well, real quick, just because you mentioned that uh, the planning commission uh, will be the one to initially review a conditional use permit under the GU-1 zone, but the, uh, those that are allowed to, to uh, weigh in are only considered uh, to be uh, interested parties within a thousand feet of that. Now this is a little bit different deal. Uh, we'll see if uh, what the Planning Commission does on that, but uh, the way that they take hearings on conditional use permits, it's very limited to just the people that are real close to it. Okay, so, thank you for sharing that. Okay, and I, ha I haven't had anything to do with that process, so thank you. <coughs> So basically, um, just to answer that first question again, like sort of looking at those four questions, does the technology exist? The answer is not yet. There, none of these have been deployed anywhere in the United States today, um, but it's coming. And I know that that's one of these technologies where we hear that a lot. Jeremy Casper, I think I have a bet with you about Cook Inlet Tidal Energy. That's coming any day too, right? Um, <laughs> so um, I, it's not here yet, but I think it is imminent. And so from that standpoint, it's worth educating ourselves about this. I'm not honestly sure if this is a, a logical choice for Alaska. I think there's a lot of other factors at play in terms of the decisions that we're making in the state. But it's worth keeping an eye on. It's worth being educated about what we're talking about here. And I think that is a role that the university can play in all of this. So second question, is it safe, right? If the technology exists, is it safe? And what does that mean? And so um, this is, again, what I said. You know, these small reactors fall under this broader character, 
um, broader category of um, advanced reactors or generation four reactors. There's a lot of word salad when you get into the nuclear energy industry. Um, but basically, um, what it really boils down to is that these reactor designs have these inherent, these intrinsic sort of built-in safety features that are really different from conventional reactor technologies. And this is the thing that, for me, um, I've done a, quite a lot of of research in myself, um, and I think that, that there's some real um, value in making sure that people understand the differences between conventional and legacy nuclear react reactors and these um, advanced reactors. And basically, those intrinsic and inherent safety features, um, the idea is really that these reactors are designed such that they actually require active active intervention power to operate. As soon as you take away all power, you take your hands off the button, they shut down automatically. And so basically, in some sort of an emergency sort of situation, they don't need active measures to keep the reactor cooled. The reaction is naturally going to want to wind down and slow down if you're not actively maintaining that reaction. And that's done through just natural passive sort of physics. Um, that's on the cooling side. I'll talk just a little bit more as, of, of an example of that in a second. But the other thing is really the way that the fuel is actually configured and packaged. Um, one example is these triso fuel particles that a lot of these manufacturers are planning to use. They're about the size of a poppy seed. And they're encapsulated, the actual uranium fuel is encapsulated in several different layers of um, kind of like these ceramic um, basically very like durable sort of um, materials that um, we really didn't have access to back in the 60s, right? And so these are ones that really can't melt at any sort of temperature that a reactor could ever get to. And they're also super abrasion resistant. So essentially each particle of uranium, I mean, poppy seed particle of uranium is sort of encapsulated in these, um, in these advanced ceramics that in themselves would prevent, like if there was any kind of a breach of the reactor, or some really extreme event happened, the distance that um, a contamination event could occur would be like the distance that a solid could travel, not a liquid or a gas or something like that. And so it's, it's pretty different. That would be a real extreme situation. Like I said, it can't melt in any kind of temperature that the reactor could ever achieve. But then on the other hand, you've got these sort of passive cooling um, attributes as well that naturally extract heat from the reactor core without the need for pumps or electricity or anything like that. And so these are two things that are pretty different about these advanced reactors. And so I, I, I usually have a few different questions like this in my slides, but I just left only this one in. So you know, we're all pretty familiar with the Trans-Alaska Pipeline and the heat pipes that you know, are basically um, extracting heat from the ground to keep the ground frozen in this case. And that's an example of like a natural process, right? Like you're, that's just natural convection of ammonia in this case in these, in these pipes that basically siphon heat out of the ground and then release that into the, into the air. And that's essentially the same process that a lot of these reactors are using. So for example, that Evinci reactor uses heat pipes to basically extract heat from the core through natural convection totally different working fluid than, um, than ammonia, but the, same, the concept is still exactly the same. And so that's an example of how you remove heat from the core through these passive, passive techniques. So okay, so if it's safe, then the next question that everybody asks, especially the utility companies, is, is this economic, right? And that's a really good question in my mind because a lot of times things are technically feasible, but they're not really economically viable. Um, I, would put, I would put Tidal Energy and Cook Inlet under, under that category. I like to tease Jeremy because he works on Tidal Energy a lot. Um, so is it economic? This is a big unknown because we haven't deployed any of these, right? And so because very few, only that new scale project, which is super different than what we would deploy here in Alaska, have even gone through the nuclear regulatory licensing process, we don't know everything that's going to be required to deploy these kinds of technologies in the field. So there's a ton of unknowns. There's a ton of unknowns around the fuel cycle. We're basically reinventing an entire industry in this, in this country. And so whatever answer a vendor is going to give you is really a bit of a guess. The only thing that I really think when I think about this is that it has to compete with conventional technologies at some point in time. Maybe not serial number one, but if it doesn't compete, we're, 
we're not going to we're not going to be able to deploy these systems. And so the vendors at least believe that it can be competitive with conventional um, power generation, especially in areas that have um, higher higher cost power. Um, so I do have like a couple slides here on that. Um, the Nuclear Energy Institute is sort of a bit of a um, it's it's a industry um, consortia. And so they've done a lot, lot of work on looking at these different cost comparisons um, compared to diesel generation. So in this case, they're sort of looking at um, a potential application in rural Alaska. I've been working with the community of Nome quite a bit because they're interested in potentially looking at micro reactors as part, part of their future um, energy sources. And so talking a lot to the mayor, John Hanlon, out there and a utility, Nome Joint Utilities, they're expecting a nine cent or they have, um, they have experienced a nine cent increase in the cost of diesel fuel for this winter compared to last winter. So it's gone up quite a bit um, this year. And so, um, you know, according to sort of the range that um, the Nuclear Energy Institute has predicted around the micro reactors, you know, there's a, there's a chance that it could be cost competitive in a place like Nome um, today. Now the question is, you know, what does that even look like? And so, you know, the idea of having a third party own and operate a system and just sell power to the utility would be the most likely type of business model that would be looked at. Um, and again, this isn't going to be happening tomorrow. Um, but, you know, in the future, if these do become available, that's probably the type of business arrangement um, that would be pursued. So there's another report um, from the Center of Economic Development at University of Alaska Anchorage. We work with them quite a bit. Um, this was put together by Rochelle Johnson, who's a close colleague of mine. Um, and she really did this market analysis looking at different um, potential options for deploying microreactors in the state. And she took a look at these four potential um, use cases. And I'm not going to go into this a lot. Um, but she did look at uh, a rural hub community, military application, mining operation, and then a rail belt application. And the last question here is like, is this a responsible technology to deploy in Alaska, in places in Alaska, in the US, globally? You know, there's a lot of questions around that, and there's a lot of questions around this that have plagued the nuclear energy industry um, over, over, um, over its life. And so, you know, one of the things I like to think about with any kind of technology is really thinking about it from a life cycle analysis standpoint. So really cradle to grave, right? And every technology that we're deploying has costs associated with. There's environmental costs associated with, Tom, the solar panels on your house, right? How are they produced? What sort of materials are entrained in those panels, right? And, um, and what are the environmental costs associated with them? Because one of the things I think about quite a bit working on in the, in the renewable energy sector is the types of materials that were, and the sort of strategies that we're using for mining those materials and where they're coming from and how they're being sourced and what power we're using to refine those materials and build those batteries and solar panels. You know, those are things that we need to be thinking about too. And the same thing with the nuclear energy industry. So uranium mining is not really that different from other kinds of mining. Um, it's pretty similar in a lot of ways, and it has the same sort of track history that mining does globally. And so that's the kind of thing that we need to be thinking about. Where are we sourcing uranium from now? Where would we be sourcing it from in the future? And then the same thing related to long-term storage, right? It's really those two ends of the spectrum for the nuclear energy life cycle that people really worry about, I, th I think a lot of, is, um, is sort of what are, what are we going to do in terms of long-term storage. And so this is an example of dry cask storage um, in, the, in the lower 48. Um, you know, that's not a problem we're going to solve here in Alaska. But there, there is um, a lot of examples best practices from around the world that we can also look at. Um, Sweden and Finland have been working on um, geologic storage, and they've also gone through this real process around consent-based siting that Department of Energy is now pursuing and following as well in terms of working with communities around where, um, where siting, long-term siting of nuclear waste makes sense. And then secondly, you know, France is the nation that uses the most nuclear energy as, in terms of a proportion of its total energy portfolio. The US produces more um, nuclear energy from, than France does, but France is about 80% about of its power comes from nuclear energy. And, and frankly, I think right now they're sitting pretty, pretty good in, in Europe, right, um, from that energy standpoint. But when France 
invested or started transitioning over to nuclear it was in, in those like late 1970s when we had the, the oil crisis. And they, their, their slogan at the time was, you know, no oil, no gas, no choice. That's the way they looked at it. Like we, didn't, we don't have a choice because we don't have these other resources and so we need to find something that'll make sure that we have a sustainable energy path into the future. And they decided to invest pretty heavily in nuclear. Um, they basically um, store, they, they reprocess a lot of the waste. So they, have, they don't have that much of it, but they basically store what they have at the nuclear sites, at the nuclear power plants themselves. And that's what we're doing in this country right now with that dry cask storage like I showed before. The problem around nuclear waste is not a technical problem. We know how to solve it from a technical standpoint. It's really a political and social challenge. And I mentioned before, you know, the green revolution. These are, I know you guys probably can't really even see this, but it shows a lot of the rare earth elements and things like that that are going into um, a lot of the green economy, you know, stuff that we're, that we're really looking to as a future. And, you know, when we think about the long term like that, we think about radioactive waste as like decaying over a long period of time. But really, some of these other materials like mercury or cadmium, they don't decay at all. Like they just stay in the environment as they are. They don't have a radioactive half-life or something like that. And most of that high-level radioactive waste, you know, within 40 years, it's only a th it's it's decayed so it's only a thousand it's it's a thousand times less radioactive as it was when it started so it does decay you know over a long period of time but a lot of that happens over the first few decades and so um, so these are just these are choices these are things we need to think about these are um, decisions that need to be made as we're thinking about the path that we want to take as a country as a state as individuals. I like this picture. I don't know if you guys can really see this, but this is like whale oil export from like up in the Barrow area in the north, Northwest Arctic um, back in the 1880s. And I, I like looking at this. These are all these barrels of whale oil, right, that are being exported from Alaska. And, you know, we as, a, as humans have gone through these different energy transitions over time and we move from one sort of energy source to another. This is Fairbanks. This is the old northern commercial the power plant's way up there on the top, right? And that's all the wood that we were using to, to power Fairbanks, right? Um, this is like in the 1920s, right? We don't, we don't, we're not using that right now, right? But um, that doesn't look super sustainable to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think it's, a, it's an interesting time. It's an interesting time to be working on energy issues because we are going through these transitions. And, and I, would, I would argue um, that we do need sources of firm, reliable power. And so one example, we work a lot with Hawaii. And Hawaii has committed to 100% renewable energy um, by 20, uh, I can't remember if it's 2040 or 50. I think it's 2050. And we talk to them quite a lot. Um, I think there's a lot of synergies between Alaska and Hawaii for all kinds of reasons. But one is talking a lot about these energy transition spaces. And Hawaii believes they cannot do it with just solar and wind. And they are in a place where they have solar and wind year round, right? They believe they need about 20% baseload power from some sort of energy source um, that they can rely on. And so whether that's, you know, ammonia from, you know, derived from hydrogen, whatever that is, they're trying to figure out what makes up that 20% of baseload power that they can rely on over time beyond the, the many, many megawatts of batteries that they're installing and many hundreds of megawatts of solar that they're installing there. So this is kind of my last slide, I think. Why am I interested in microreactors? Um, because I do think it's something that can provide baseload power. It's not gonna rely on the wind or the sun, and it does provide heat. And I think in a place like Alaska, heat is almost as valuable as electric power. And I think um, that's why it, it is of interest to me because it's a thermal source of, of generation, carbon-free. I think that's pretty important. Um, it, I think it's safer. I mean, there, there's some questions, right? I put some question marks after some of these because I view this as an exploration. We don't have all of the answers today. I'm interested in continuing to explore this technology and to see where it goes and see how things evolve. I do think that it could potentially be competitively priced in the future. 
I don't think that um, anyone can be making a decision about buying a micro reactor today as part of their you know, generation portfolio or plan for the future, um, but that might change in the next five or 10 years. Um, I think that it provides better certainty of energy costs. I'm thinking a little bit about rural Alaska here. I'm thinking about John Hanlon in Nome dealing with you know, the, the remnants of you know, the, the storm that they just had and um, dealing with a nine cent per nine cent per kilowatt increase in the cost of energy this year, just this year because of, because of global pricing, you know, that's really tough for these communities um, to deal with. And so more stability of energy pricing is, is, is pretty valuable too. Um, reduced risk of environmental contamination. Another thing I think about a lot, you know, we're, we worry about concentrated forms of contamination in our environment, but we don't worry as much or we don't seem to care as much about more diffuse um, forms of environmental contamination. When I go out to rural Alaska, I see so much evidence of fuel spills in so many ways over so many areas, you know. And so what is kind of the, the accumulated impact of that kind of contamination of soil, of the environment over time, it's hard to quantify, right? Um, and then I think it could complement other Alaska energy resources. I think that nuclear could provide that backbone that could help us increase um, the renewable development in the state as well, because that's one of our challenges is making sure that we can balance renewables and, and, um, and make them a big part of our future as well. So I think that's all I've got. Um, there's a working group. We've had this up and running for about a year. If you guys are interested in learning more, we have speakers every month. The Air Force is going to be talking about the IELTSN project next month. Um, so we would very much welcome you guys to go to the ASAP website. Amanda, I don't know when our new website's coming up, but you can just get to it from our front page right now, the nuclear um, working group. And it's really just about educating Alaskans about the technology and bringing speakers in and hearing from vendors, hearing from um, various kinds of experts, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Like I said, the Air Force will be the next speaker on the 13th of October, I think. So, and that's it. So, thank you. Okay, I don't know. You two are, but I'll, you go ahead. Yeah, uh, sodium cooled reactors coming into the picture. Well, that's, I mean, sodium cooled, oh, uh, th that's what these are. That, that's not, that's, that's, that's what these are. So, um, so for example, um, that sodium would actually be the, the, the cooling um, fluid, ba fluid basically used for that Evinci reactor. So these include, these include a lot of different kinds of cooling mechanisms, but these would also cover sodium reactors would fall under those advanced reactor designs. Is that what you have with the molten salt and the thorium reactor? Thorium is different. <laughs> um, so thorium reactors, I, I actually did some, I knew somebody was going to ask about thorium today. <laughs> so I actually looked it up um, because thorium reactors do, do come up and, they're, and it's been um, discussed as an alternative mechanism. Thorium in itself isn't fissile. You have to kind of make it fissile. So unlike uranium that's naturally going to decay, you kind of have to force thorium to decay, which actually makes it safer in some ways because it has that sort of inherent safety passive sort of feature to it. Um, I think that, and I could be wrong about this, but the way I see it is that it really is sort of like AC power and DC power, right? We've got like, you know, Tesla and Edison, and somebody won that. Somebody won that, right? Tesla won and we use AC power today. And um, that's sort of what happened with uranium and thorium. We could have gone a thorium route, but so much work's done, been done in uranium now, we'd have to back away from that and really start all, it's a different, really different process with thorium. So I think that right now, it seems to me like the industry is very much still focused on uranium as being the fissile source for the reactor designs. We've got a question back there. Okay, I, uh, um, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, just a quick comment and then a question. So uh, the comment is, yep, 100% right, France uses the highest per capita of nuclear power on the planet. It's really interesting, right now half of the reactors are offline because of climate change, low, low river levels in Europe and maintenance issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question for you has to do with the, the passage of the recent uh, Inflation Reduction Act. And I don't know if you've looked yet at what influence will that have on the development and deployment of small modular reactors? 
I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. No idea. Um, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act includes a three dollars per kilo, kilo uh, uh, production tax credit for hydrogen. So what it means is that our future is ammonia and methanol from wind. And then you I'm scared. Of <laughs> How about in the in the, in the yellow? So I have two quick questions. One, you kept using the word deploying in the United States. Are mm. the rest of the world mm -hmm. us behind us? Small. And then mm. B, you also talked about the, um, the original nuclear power plants were these little small ones in some marines. So that seems like the micro power plants have been around for 60 years. That's right. What, is it, what happened to them? That's right. So actually that, that term small or micro or whatever, it's kind of misleading because I don't really want a Fort Greeley project to happen in Alaska or anywhere else again because that's essentially a reactor out of a, out of a nuclear sub. That's what that thing is, right? That's what that was. And that, that wasn't intrinsically or inherently safe, right? Um, <laughs> and so, um, so that's, that's to answer that question. Um, but globally, this is definitely something that's happening globally. So one thing, you know, Canada is doing a lot in this space. Um, they are in some ways ahead on the regu regulatory front um, related to, to microreactors. And some of these designs, like Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation, are actually planning to deploy in Canada first. In that case, um, they've got you know, a reactor test site, kind of like the one that we have at Idaho National Lab that I showed a picture of earlier. So there's a lot of interest there. Now, in other places, there's also these, sm so again, small is not advanced necessarily. Those are in the US, we're not gonna have a small reactor that doesn't fall under this advanced reactor category. But in other places, and I actually do, I have a couple other slides. Okay, here's, <laughs> um, here's one. So this, this project is um, a, a, a in Russia. So this is kind of across the Bering Sea. There's a couple of these that are barge mounted um, nuclear power plants. And so this is conventional power plant technology. These are light water reactor designs. Um, they're, not high, they're not like a, a, a naval reactor. They're not like highly enriched like that, but they're more like a land-based reactor mounted on a barge for community-based power in Russia. And so these are happening over on the other side of the Bering Sea, right? And so, um, so, so, there are many other countries that are moving this direction. China very much is too, right? And so um, these reactor designs are being developed other places. Right now the US is still seen as the global leader in terms of um, nuclear energy development. We could lose that advantage. Um, that's one thing that the industry is concerned about. But right now there's still quite a bit of activity here in the US, but it's definitely happening elsewhere well, as well. We still have, have the green over Romania to go uh, free right now. I, that is game. probably true. I, I know that there's, um, there's, I know that when I talk to the vendors, they are getting calls day and night from European countries saying, <laughs> how soon could you build us a reactor? I, I think there's a lot of interest right now, but I, I do believe that that's true. I, I mean, there's, there is some development there. Okay. I don't know, you guys, I'm scared. Um, all right. And I'm going to come over here. Go ahead. The efficient use of energy is one of the most important things in nuclear reaction. The light water reaction that we have now is only about 5% efficient or less. In other words, 95% of that fuel ends up being stored and available for misuse or future use. These new uh, reactors are advertised between 5 uh, only 5% waste. In other words, they're 95, some of them are advertising 95% efficiency. Some of them are, are, look like they're probably less than 50%. Is, and that question is hard to, to verify with these small companies. How do you get that information? Somebody like you need to ask them. Yeah, so, so what you're talking about is the amount of material, like, you know, uranium essentially that's required and like what, how much of that is actually used during the process and how much of it could be recycled and how much of it is really waste long term. Is that, is that what you're sort of asking? Because the federal government yeah. will probably end up storing waste again and it will cost all of us money. That's, so that's, that's very true. That's yeah, better. that's right. Um, that's right. That's true. Now, the amount of waste in a volume standpoint that we're talking about here isn't 
huge, right? I, I mean, from a volume standpoint, it's not a tremendous amount. Like it's being stored right now at the existing power plants and in those dry casks and stuff like that. I think I read somewhere that all of the nuclear waste put together would fit into, in around the world, would fit into two Olympic-sized swimming pools. That ain't true. I don't know if that's true. I, I, I don't. I did not research that. So, and it's also sort of a little bit about what are we talking about? There's high level waste, there's lower level waste, you know, of the waste um, that comes out of a reactor, I think only 5% is considered that high level waste that also decays quicker, but then is a longer, is a longer, is an, is an, is an issue over a longer period of time. Um, I, I don't really know exactly how to answer all of those questions around the long-term disposal of nuclear waste, other than to say that this country needs, needs to develop a plan. There needs to be a plan. And there is an effort to work in that direction. You know? So that's, what I, that's all I can say. Every single technology has waste associated with it, though. And I do think we also need to kind of remember that and take that into account. You have to kind of weigh and balance these different options. So did you have a question? Yeah, you know, the 95% is uranium, the thorium consumes about, consumes 95% and you have 5% waste. The decision to use uranium in the United States was made in the 50s yeah. because uranium provides its byproduct, plutonium, for nuclear bombs. We built nuclear technology to for build weapons, bombs. For weapons. We had our last thorium plant was closed down in 68. Yeah. What's interesting to me is that the Chinese and, the, and in India, they are leading in thorium development. And because, it, 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 yep. as you say, you have to push it to make it react. Yep. You don't need a cooling source. The Chinese are building them in the Gobi Desert. Mm -hmm. And we're you know, going down the nuclear uranium-based path, I think is absolutely idiotic. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be looking at thorium. We've dropped the ball on it in 68. We should never have done that. We're being driven by nuclear bombs, which is the last thing this world needs. And I hate to see us, I mean, this little stuff looks cool and safe, but it's a dead end path in the Chinese. Well, we're... Well, we might, be, we might be buying reactors from them someday yeah, in the future. Well, we'll, we'll just be learning Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, how do you see the feasibility study between Copper Valley Electric Association and USNC contributing to this discussion for Alaska? Could you repeat the question? Um, the question was how, how the feasibility study between USNC and um, Copper Valley Electric Association contributes to the conversation in Alaska. I mean, it's between a vendor and a utility, right? Um, so inherently, it's biased toward a technology and a certain technology path. Um, I've really tried to stay more technology agnostic. Like, like Alaska Center for Energy and Power has refused to sign any kind of NDAs with any individual vendors because I don't want any secret information. I, I want to know public information and be able to um, provide accurate information to the public as I have it. You know, um, I do think that they're going to really take a look at all of the potential use cases. Like in that case, Copper Valley and, and, and Valdez, they are 100% hydropowered at, at times of the year. So there's going to be questions around, can you shut the thing down, which is, I think, what they're looking at, right? Um, can you use it for industrial processes? What does that look like? You know, um, We talked about, somebody mentioned hydrogen and ammonia. Um, nuclear technology is an, has another potential path to actually develop hydrogen and ammonia, because you can do that like for using high temperature, you know, cracking and things like that, and so not just using electrolyzers. So there's different paths, and I think that they'll be exploring some of those, and I think it'll, it'll provide interesting information. But at the end of the day, it's a particular vendor with a utility looking at a particular use case that fits their technology. So, Thanks, yeah. Microreactors. Have there been discussion with the manufacturers or potential manufacturers? It seems to me they are used once and throw away. And, and what's your response for it after 10 years? Yeah, so, so a couple things, and I actually meant to mention this too, because I want to make sure you know, I'm getting information out there. Number one, um, microreactors or small reactors aren't necessarily going to produce less waste okay, than conventional reactor technologies, because you've got less. There's just less efficiency around having a smaller amount of nuclear material in one place, so it's not a huge amount more. But I know that there's been some studies that show it does produce slightly more. <laughs> Secondly, that encapsulation of the fuel that keeps it from coming in contamination, be, 
Reducing any opportunity for it to contaminate the environment also makes it incredibly difficult to recycle, right? So you're removing opportunities for recycling of that fuel. So that was, you know, another thing, a point I want to make. What was your question around? Oh, God. And we've got time okay. for a couple more questions, and then we do have to empty um, uh, the space, but more information is available on the Lab and Center for Energy and Power website. Is, does ASAP or, or is there a resource online that lists the various designs of yeah. these reactors? So, so, so the, the report does, does go into details on a few of them. We did a workshop on micro reactors that's available online from our website that was really, really good. It was a three-day workshop and it, and it had a lot of different speakers. It was Alaska focused. Um, I encourage you guys to take a look at that if you're interested. And I'm also hoping that this isn't gonna be the last conversation we're having. What I would really like to do is, I don't view myself as an expert on this, right? I've been working on this for 13 years, but I'm not a nuclear engineer. And I would like to bring other experts from Idaho National Lab and from other um, places to continue to answer some of the questions that the community has around the technology and make sure we're getting information out there so everyone has, has an understanding of, of the technology. So, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what is the U.S. goal in um, the research and the fusion reactor potential in the, uh, in the future and how many years out do you think? There's, there's, there's a lot of research being done on fusion, actually, in the US. Um, if you ever, I, I just joke around, because anytime I talk to anybody from MIT, they just talk about fusion. Like, <laughs> they're really, really sold on fusion. And I, and I don't think not for a bad reason, right? And it goes again, like, I do think it's tricky to sustain a fusion reaction, um, but not impossible. And um, cold fusion, probably not gonna happen, right? Cold fusion is probably off the table. but. Um, but I do think that fusion is something that the U.S. is also investigating. I don't know where they are with thorium right now. I really don't know. Okay. This dog has his hands up a Who? Right here. Okay. Hi. Um, just a question, you know, we're looking at cost, um, you know, and you want to put it out into really, um, you know, austere parts of Alaska. And um, what about security? Yeah, security is a really good question. I mean, it's something that we're even like looking about with conventional nuclear in the Ukraine right now. I mean, security around the nuclear energy industry is a big deal, right? And that's part of why some of these are designed for subsurface installation. The immediate question that comes to mind is how does that work in permafrost, right? Um, but I think that um, security is a, is a big piece of the thinking that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is going to put behind these. So like that is one of those things that they're not going to, um, treat these differently from the um, expectation they have around safety, security, than they would a large reactor design. That's, that's the way the NRC answers that question is that they'll have the same expectations in terms of safety and security. We don't know exactly what that means yet, and it could be very specific to different vendors and different reactor designs, whether it's subsurface, above surface, you know, wh how it's packaged, those kinds of questions. But it's definitely something that the NRC has made clear that they don't, um, small reactors aren't gonna be treated um, less than large reactors from a safety and security issue. You got a great audience here. Why don't you take a quick poll? Do you have any poll oh, questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the audience to respond to? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are a really tough crowd. <laughs> I know my daughter's in the room there. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, no, I, I, I actually, I'm really deeply appreciative of the number of people that have come out to, to have this conversation today. I would really like to continue this. I, I'm frustrated, we, get, we, gotta, we gotta leave, we gotta get, we're getting kicked out. But um, I actually would really like to figure out a mechanism for continuing this conversation. I'd like to get as many of your questions answered as possible. I don't know if there's some, there's more people here than I expected. So I don't know if there's some way to capture additional questions please feel free to email us, um, reach out. Um, and I think we should just set up, I'd like to set up kind of a recurring um, series of lectures and not just listen to me, but hear other perspectives um, from around the country and from Idaho National Lab. And I really appreciate the Northern Alaska Environmental Center for being open to kind of co-hosting this event. Um, I really wanted to get people out from the community that, that have really tough questions, right? I don't, I don't want it to be talking to the people that are 
bought into the technology, I want to be having conversations with people that are skeptical and have really good questions. And I feel like that's what we've, we've had here tonight. And I'm really appreciative of, of the questions that have been asked. And I wish we didn't have to stop. But um, yeah. So.